Psalm 63, and let's pray. Lord, open our eyes to this wonderful psalm and to the wonderful truth that through your spirit David has conveyed to us. And we know that, uh, that the flowers fail and that man will return to the earth, but that your word stands forever. And that it's sharper than any double-edged sword. So may we, O oh Lord, uh, rejoice in that as it is proclaimed, and may we receive it in faith and love. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the word of God, Psalm 63, a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches, because you have been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek my life to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him shall glory. But the mouth of those who speak lies shall be stopped. Amen. May God add richly to his word as we consider it here today. This uh, first introductory uh, point, it may seem a little random, but it relates to the second introduc introductory uh, point that I'll make, is that Harvard released this study, and people were given the choice to sit quietly with their own thoughts alone for 15 minutes. Right? So I'm going to sit and just reflect and think and ponder with my own thoughts for 15 minutes, or else the other option is that they would self-administer painful electronic shocks to themselves. Right. Option A, right. option B, I'll push the button and it's painful. And I'm not making this up. 67% of the men chose to administer those, uh, these painful electronic shocks to themselves rather than to be, sit alone with their thoughts. And 25% of the women chose to do the same. So about half in total. So, boy, a lot, of, a lot of things could be said about that from a lot of different uh, uh, perspectives. But the second point, I think, is related. The great Christian uh, Blaise Pascal, a brilliant mathematician, a physicist, philosopher, and more, was a serious believer, wrote that all of our unhappiness comes from one thing, our inability to sit quietly in a room alone. Blaise Pascal, 17th century wrote Ponzi's, the collection of his, uh, of his thoughts he intended to present a Christian apology. And in it, he portrayed humankind, uh, humankind as helpless without God and suspended on one side from wretchedness and on the other side, happiness. That mankind, that one side, there's, you've got wretchedness, and the other side, uh, ha happiness, and noting that people tried to avoid the abyss by engaging in distractions. They avoid the abyss. They avoid that, that nothingness. They avoid that emptiness. They avoid that by what? Distracting themselves by, if you will, self-administering painful electronic shocks to themselves as one example or uh, illustration. So I'm going to tie, Lord willing, this to Psalm 63 and what David has to say, especially the psalmist uh, David, when he says in verse 3, because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall, uh, shall uh, praise you. And I simply ask the question, can you say that? Like, can you say that, that, that you, God, are better than life itself? A tough one, but one that we should be chasing after.
David says that there, there, there are those who seek his life to destroy it. And that he is in a dry and thirsty land. And I want to begin with this foundational point that man's condition includes much wretchedness. And we live near the abyss to go back to uh, what Blaise Pascal had to say. That we live near the uh, uh, abyss. That David, the author of the psalm, the enemies wanted to, sh to kill him. They wanted to take him down and he was running for his life in the desert, we read of in, in 1 uh, Samuel. He was in a dry and weary land. He was in the desert and that's dry and weary in more ways than just the literal manner. That is that, uh, that he was, he was uh, lacking. And all of us, uh, yeah, we may not literally be in that dry uh, and, and, and uh, uh, thirsty land but we all have our different issues and you don't have to be a Christian to grant the misery of life. So Mark speaks about, what term does he use about the misery of life? Those who just took the Sunday school class? Alienation. Man is alienated. He didn't come up with that out of the blue. There's something uh, to be said uh, for, uh, for that. Jordan Peterson talks about life is tragic. Life is tragic tragic and goes on to speak of how it's wretched and futile and a miserable life. Ha, how's that for an encouraging, for an encouraging line from Mr. Peterson? Wretched and futile and a miserable life. And I heard him listening to a lecture this week. He talks about, he, he, he talks about, he says that life is tragic for sure. The question only is, is it going to be tragic and hell on earth at the same time? So he gives the account of, and, and I'm not making light of this, that that when you're around a relative, when you're around your mother who's about to die, that that is tragic. Right? You want a different word, fine. But that everybody knows something's wrong, right? That this is, this is dark. Right? And he says, and that's the case for everyone, right? Everyone is in that position, if you will, at one point or, or another. Whether or not it's your mother and so forth, but that you're around and that there's death and that, that hurts, that you mourn, that, uh, that, that there's loss, that there's darkness, that, there's, uh, that there is such a thing as death. And then he, he goes on to say, that it's, but it's not only tragic, but for some people who are around that person who is about to die and all the siblings, all the sisters and brothers are fighting and at war with one another, then he says not only is death, not only is life tragic, but then life is a living hell on top of that in light of our sinful proclivity to, to make it worse than it even needs, than it needs uh, to be. And the Bible, of course, calls this sin or the effects of sin. Sometimes in the Bible and in our uh, confessional standards, we talk about misery, that there's this thing called misery, that the effect of sin is that there's misery in this, in this world and, and uh, in this uh, life, that we're called, that we're short of glory, that there is no glory, or that Ecclesiastes, for instance, speaks about all of life is what? What is all of life? Right? Vanity or a mist, like it's here and then it's gone. It's, it's, it, 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 there's no glory, there's no, seemingly no substance, no weight to it. It's just here and gone. And then we try to fill ourselves with distractions, uh, the writer uh, Solomon says, right? That, oh, I thought that I'd become wise. And then I realized that all oh, the wise people died just like, the, just like the unwise. And then I thought, oh, I'd chase down money. But then I realized, well, the rich, they die just like the poor. And, and in fact, man is no different, rich or poor. They're, poor. they're the same. In fact, he even goes on to say, how's this for a sermon some Sunday? That man has it no better than the animals that we all die and we go to the dust. But what does Solomon say? Where does it all lead? It's perhaps not a, exactly a pick-me-up at, at, at every point, but actually, in, in one sense, it is a pick-me-up. In this sense, for those who like honesty about life, for those who like people to tell you the truth, like not just some, some you know, uh, sweet story that everything's okay. Everything is not okay. There are people in Ellis today who will die young people who will die, and there's something wrong with that. And Solomon then helps us to, in some way, say, yeah, there's a reality to that, and I chased after this, this, uh, this goal of mine my whole life, and yet it didn't satisfy. So what does Solomon end up saying at the end? He says, look, what's the only answer? What is your answer? It's in God. 
Chase after God, fear God, and keep His commandments. That that's the whole duty that, that, yeah, you can read this book and that book, but in the end, where do you end up? You end up that you better be, that you better be content in God and chasing after God and knowing God and, and satisfied in God, which then brings us to the point that his son, no, his father made, uh, David in Psalm 63. That's exactly what David did. He finds, the, he finds his, his satisfaction in God. And I want the people of God to have that here today. He has something. David has something that really satisfies him. I mean, really satisfies. It's not make-believe. It's not, I'm okay, you're okay. But know that, it, that he is uh, satisfied. Something that is beautiful and wonderful and lovely. That he has some level of contentment and happiness and satisfaction that is deep, that is really deep deep, that is not just some facade or some, uh, some story to tell somebody, but it goes to the bone, or better yet, it's from the heart itself. So David says, O oh God, you are my God. You are mine. He speaks to the living God and he says that you are my God. He makes a testimony. He testifies as to what, uh, wh who he is and, and how, he sees, how he sees life. O oh Lord, you are my God. And I will say that and the world will know it, that God is my God, the living God, uh, the true God, the God of Israel. And early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. That is that you, not only are you my God, but I am going to chase after you. I am going to run you down. I am going to yearn for you. I am going to seek after you. I am going to pursue God. I, am, I know that this is what it's all about. That his goal, that his end, that it is, that it is a priority. That when he gets up in the, in the, in the morning and he makes his to-do list, chase after God. Seek God is first and primary. That, that, that has the star next to it. If you do it like, like you write down 20 things and there's so many things you'd end up not doing any of them and you ignore it. He has this one underlined and highlighted and the star next to it. Make sure, seek after God on this day that God has given me. Yearn for Him. Search after knowing Him. Chase Him down. Seek Him. O oh God, You are my God. Early will I seek You. My soul thirsts for You. My flesh longs for You in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. The longings of these verses, this is a quote, is not the groping of a stranger, uh, but feeling, feeling his way toward God, but the eagerness of a friend, almost a lover, almost a lover, to be in touch with the one who ho he holds dear. The simplicity and boldness of Thou art my God is the secret of all that follows. You want a foundation for the day? You want a foundation for the week? Seek after God and let that be, uh, let that be in, uh, your testimony and your foundation, saying, I need you and I want you. And perhaps... For many of us, that's a bit awkward to say. We're not Pentecostals. We're masculine. We're the tough guys. We're the intellectual guys. We're the, we're the guys who somehow have it all worked out, and yet David David was a man's man, I think. Who, who did he, didn't he wrestle with somebody? Didn't somebody give him a little bit of trouble when he was caring for the sheep? I think it was a, it was a bear. Was it a bear? And a lion? He says, I need you, Lord. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary. I've seen you in the sanctuary to your power and to your glory. He wants to see God. He recognizes God. He knows the reality of God experientially so that God is. And for the Jew then, where would the Jew find God? But in the sanctuary, the honeymoon suite for God and his people. God is near to his people in the tabernacle, soon to be the temple. And, and, uh, 
and uh, now even as he is in the desert, he could picture that, he could chase after that. He wants to know of God's presence, of his glory and his power, and then goes on to say, because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. That's the verse that gets me. That to know God's love is better than life itself, is better than, than life itself. We'll come, we'll come back to that. And then what's in the belly in David, so to speak, must come out. So he praises the Lord. My lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. He's not embarrassed to lift up his hands in worship. <laughs> He's not embarrassed to call upon the name of the Lord. He's not embarrassed to sing loudly. Like, oh no, somebody's going to think I'm weird. Somebody's going to think I'm funny. Somebody's going to think I'm a psycho. I'm a fanatic raising his hands and praising the Lord because he just can't keep it in. He's given over uh, to God, uh, to God himself. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. That, uh, that he's not only praising the Lord, but that he's satisfied in the Lord. That he's satisfied as though he's eating the best meal, marrow and fatness. That is the richest of foods. That, that what is it that if you had a special occasion at a wedding or whatever the case may be, and you say, honey, let's, let's break the bank and let's go, let's go big here. Let's, let's have a feast that would bring us such joy and we are going to eat the finest foods possible. And he says, uh, David says, that I am satisfied in that, in that manner. That is, that he has a deep satisfaction. That he's actually content. That he's not, quote, alienated. He's not sitting in misery. He's not a cog in this wretched, futile, miserable life, so to to speak, that he's not debating the tragedy of life, that he has something, an antidote, a, wi a, winning, uh, a winning ticket, so to speak, that he has the answer and he's communicating that uh, to us. And I'll just say for now, his answer is better than, elect than an electric shock. I wouldn't want to go too far with this. I'm not want to impose something the Bible doesn't impose, but what do you do with your thoughts? Like when you have, like when you sit down by the lakeside, what is it that you think about? What fills your mind? What fills your heart? Or uh, to go to where the psalmist is going, what do you think about through the watches of the night? When you wake up, what is it that you think about? Do you think about the, the Mets losing or the Yankees winning? Or do you think about somebody that you're angry with? Or do you or do are your thoughts upon the living God and the true God? Would you ever consider, consider uh, having that phone next to your bed? And instead of, uh, if you wake up in the middle of the night, to go to Twitter or Facebook again, to actually go to a Bible app, which should be on your phone, that seems like I can say that, and actually to listen to the Psalms, and that your heart would be at peace and in that way seek to be close to God, or that you'd play, if, if, you, if you have this knowledge, you'd work your way through the Psalms or other portions of the Bible, or meditate on, on, uh, on something beautiful in the Bible, that you would, that, that, huh, I should get back to sleep, it's one o'clock in the morning, but what should I fill my mind with? Maybe I'll meditate on the goodness of the Lord, and maybe I'll breathe deeply, I'll breathe deeply and say, uh, and remind myself that uh, the Lord, He is God, that He is good, and that we are to be at peace in him. B, 
Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. And to think that over and over and over again as you have a time uh, to do that. In verse 6, I say this, when I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. That's what filled his, fills his mind and, and uh, his, his, his heart. Uh, because you have been my help, therefore in the shadow of your wings I will rejoice that God is real to him, that there is tangible, existential help so that this beautiful metaphor, right, of the shadow of, of, of your wings, that, uh, that uh, technically not a metaphor, okay, uh, that, that the picture of the bird protecting, the mother bird protecting her young and that the Lord, in fact, protecting us. My soul, my soul follows close behind you in verse 8. Your right hand upholds me, or some translations, my soul clings to you, uh, O or, or, or God, clings after it as if in hot pursuit, or some of the older translations, my soul followeth hard after thee. My soul followeth hard uh, after, after me. And then confidence knowing that God himself upholds him in verse 8b. Eight, uh, eight, uh, and then in verses 9 through 11, but those who seek my life to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. There shall be a portion of, for jackals, but the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him shall glory, but the mouth of those who speak lies shall be stopped. So that's the psalm. I think it's quite a mouthful. A confession of longing for God and security in the presence of God. A uh, confession of longing for God and security in the presence of God in light of the threat of deadly enemies so that God is his desire. Right? Number one, God is his delight. Number two, and God is his defense. Number three. You want the psalm in a few words? Right? That God is his desire. He desires after God. God is his delight. He delights in the Lord, and then God is his defense as he comes upon his struggles or his trials. And he does that with all beauty and dignity and glory and majesty in the language uh, that, uh, that he uses. And as I mentioned, uh, my favorite line, because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips uh, shall praise you. Uh, has said that is uh, uh, that God's love, his kindness, his piety, his, re his, his beauty, that the Lord's uh, kindness and love is ever uh, before him and it's better than life. And I, I think that's a, as I think, uh, I'll just say pietists could take this too far, but that's a fair question. Is there any sense in which I can say, you can say that, that your love, O oh Lord, is better than than life itself. Right? We, we, we tend to think of God as, yeah, it's been said, right, God's the spare tire. When you're really in trouble, you get him out. You know what I mean? And there is a sense in which, right, even Paul writes about these things happen to us so that we would not rely on ourselves but rely on God who raises the dead. So there is a sense in which as trials come our way uh, that, we would, uh, that we would call out to God, and that's part of what David is, is doing here. But there's also a sense in which this should be our mindset all the time, that we would say that, yes, that there is something bigger than even life itself, that God's love is bigger and better and more beautiful and more, more central to, uh, to life I itself, to know that and to experience of that. And, of course, this is not the only place in the Bible where we read uh, these types of things. Deuteronomy 4.29, but, but if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you seek him with all of your heart and with all of your soul. Uh, Deuteronomy 4.29. Uh, Psalm 42.1, as the deer pants for streams of water, my soul pants for you, O Lord. Right? The beautiful picture that's painted in Psalm uh, 42. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, where is your God? Or later, the psalmist, I think it's Psalm 91, my soul yearn, yearns, even faints for the courts of our Lord, uh, for the courts of uh, the Lord. My uh, heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. It may be Psalm 84. I need to check that. But you get, uh, you, you get what I'm, I'm saying.
And what I'm suggesting, the simple point here today, is that Christian maturity looks like this. And Oh, it may manifest itself in different people and in different cultures differently. It may look differently if you're a, a Dutchman versus an Italian. It may look uh, different if you're a Russian versus a Jew, although you could be uh, both, obviously. You may, it may look differently if you're Reformed versus Pentecostal. Okay, okay, that's fine. I have no... Uh, problems with this is how it's expressed in, in, in different situations and in different settings. But don't be hide, hide behind being a Scot or a German and say that you were reformed so that this doesn't really apply to you. But that's for those other Christians. I listened to uh, a Dr. Bonson's sermon uh, this week, Greg Bronson was a very smart, educated OPC man, philosopher, like amazingly smart. And I studied uh, uh, under him. I'm thankful uh, for that. Like, and if I, if I was going to have a debate with anyone, I'd want Dr. Bronson on my side. Right? And in preaching on Psalm 63, he uh, talked about a fainting heart. And one of the things he said, there's a difference between knowing intellectually that God is omniscient, right, that he's an omnipresent, right, that he knows everything that he's ever, and, and that he's everywhere, and actually knowing that, if you will, experientially, if I can use that language, it may make us a little nervous. And as he was preaching the sermon, this, these were a series of sermons, that he preached when his heart was broken after he ended up being divorced by his wife. And crying out to God, crying out to God, crying, be near unto me, be near unto me. You could tell he was a broken man. He was not, he was not this bold, if you will, strong and confident philosopher who had all the answers. He was a broken man in light of, if you will, the brokenness of life, calling out to God and saying, God, would you be near unto me? Would you, O Lord, satisfy me? Would you give me the faith that David himself, that David himself has? So the call then is to set the Lord before us in mind and in spirit. This, if I can put it this way, this intimacy is not natural uh, to any of us. And it's interesting that the one quotation before said that uh, the Lord was almost, that the exchange was almost like a lover uh, that is living in the presence of the Lord and living in the presence of the Lord. And Jesus says, what good would it be for a man if he gains the whole world? That is, he gets it all and loses his soul. And my question would be, what good would it be for uh, those of us in our circles if we understood all Christian doctrine uh, the, within the doctrinals camp? And I believe that you should know good doctrine and that we should chase after it and defend it. There's no qualms here. And what good would it be if we understood critical race theory and Marxism and everything else as we put on our worldview cap. And we should understand those things uh, and they're important to us. But what good would that be if we have all of that and we can't say because, of your, loving because your loving kindness is better than life? As though there's some tension between being in one camp or the other camp or, or in a, a, a different camp. What good would it be? So it's interesting to me in light of what Pascal, the quotation from Pascal uh, in, er, in the introduction, that my days are usually pretty full, like just go, right? Next, next, next. And at my age, by the end of the day, when I, after dinner and so forth, I'm saying, okay, I better stop for a little bit. Like, you know, I'm not 30 years old anymore. Right? But what's interesting is then when I pause at some points in, in the week, what is it that I do? And do I need to be distracted? Like, do I need to run to Twitter? Or do I need to run to the to the freezer and get ice cream, or something which would, something which would, if you will, try and satisfy or 
get me over, if you will, the hump. And, and, and my point is, I think when I'm at my best, I'm much more content. And when I'm not at my best, if you will, relationally with the Lord, I'm struggling and groping and looking and something maybe will, something maybe will scratch the itch. When ultimately the itch is God himself, or that God would, uh, knowing uh, God, God himself. So can you sit at peace at all? Uh, when you wake up at the night, what is it, uh, what is it that you think? Uh, the modern world is designed to exploit your human weaknesses, to make you lonely and fat and broken and lecherous and spiritually dead. The modern world is designed to exploit your human weaknesses, to make you lonely, fat, broke, lecherous, and spiritually dead. So when we spoke last week about spiritual warfare, this is spiritual warfare, that your soul would be right with God. And that you would be satisfied in nothing else but God himself. That you would not be distracted. That you would not let the devil distract you. So the devil in his warfare today is not as much that you're going to somehow see him with a pitchfork in that little red uniform that he supposedly wears. Not as much that as you have Netflix right in front of you and you're going to go hard on Netflix for four hours when you have not gone before the Lord in his presence. Or fill in the Netflix, whatever it is for you. Maybe it's Union College football or hockey. So Hollywood and Madison Ave, and we have our own private idols somehow, somehow trying to satisfy. And the reminder then is that nothing will satisfy but living in living in nothing will satisfy but living in the presence of God. Nothing else will do. Our heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. Who said that? It's about the hundredth time I've quoted it. Our hearts are restless till we find, till our hearts find rest in you. Augustine, Augustine, who was undone because of his, if you will, his, his, yeah, uh, his darkness and did not, did not know where, uh, where, where uh, to go, if you will. Uh, Lewis writes, God designed, God designed the human machine to run on himself. He himself is the fuel our spirits were designed to burn. Or to, I don't know who said this. Maybe lots of people have said this. You have a God-shaped hole and you will have no, uh, you will have no peace until God properly uh, fills fills that hole. And when you don't have peace, this is a quote from Ed Welch that I've used before in his book on depression and darkness that I read this quote and it has stayed with me for, this has got to be 10 years, 15 years ago. The feeling of emptiness is usually a sign that we have put our trust, wait, let me make sure I say this slowly enough. Someone, uh, Pastor Gregson told me that I read my quotes too quickly when he was here two or three weeks ago. So I'm going to read this one a bit more slowly. He is allowed to do that. He is older than me and... The feeling of emptiness is usually a sign that we have put our trust in something that cannot sustain us. That's him. And I'll say, that hit me like a truck. He goes on to say, it reminds us that we were created to trust in our Heavenly Father and in nothing else. Keep probing. Life is ultimately about God. So the psalmist then in probing uh, the call is that you would desire and delight in him. Desire, desire not just God's gifts, not just when he is the spare tire when you need him, but that for uh, love the giver over the gifts itself. That is, love God despite your circumstances, no matter what your, your uh, situation, and to follow in the lines of uh, O'Connor. Dear Lord, Please make me want you. You want a prayer? You want something to take home? Dear Lord, please make me want you. It would be the greatest bliss. Not just to want you when I think about you, but to want you all the time. To think about you all the time. To have the want driving in me. To have it like a cancer in me. It would kill me like a cancer. And that would be the fulfillment. So that desire for God and then delight in God, that we would stop nibbling at the table of the world and that we would be led to the cross where his love is poured out, 
that we would be on our knees. Lord, I lay myself down before you. Rid me of myself. I belong to you, O Lord. Lead me, lead me to that cross, that cross of Christ. My soul shall be satisfied accordingly. So my soul followeth hard after thee. That's the pastor's appeal. And we actually, uh, if you think I'm being hard on the, some of the things I said about some Reformed people, we say that the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him. It's my prayer for the people here and the people in our midst today, is that you would enjoy him, that he would be your, your, uh, your uh, satisfaction in and through our Lord Jesus Christ. So let us pray. Lord, may we learn to meditate even on our bed in the night watches of your goodness, of your love, of your said, of your, your, uh, your presence. May that be, O oh Lord, who we are, that we would seek after you by the day, by the hour, even by the minute to that end. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.